So this is my senior project, my capstone. This is an automatic and self-recoverable Niskin bottle for oceanographic water sampling. So first, uh, we'll get a little, uh, give you a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about oceanographic water sampling in general. Uh, we're going to uh, define the engineering question or the problem, uh, and then we're going to start discussing about how I tackled that problem. Uh, the methods include numerical analysis, 3D modeling, and printing, as well as circuit design and programming. And then we'll uh, conclude and talk about what I learned, how far we've come, and then we'll have a little bit of a Q&A. So why do we why do oceanographers sample water? There's a vast majority of reasons, and there are um, you know thousands to millions of dollars spent on oceanographic research every year where water sampling surveys are done. Um, typically, water samples are uh, water is sampled for chemical analysis, you know stuff like species identification, ecology, um, a lot of biochemical uh, stuff, and how we can better treat the ocean and as well as aquaculture, geochemistry, and climate research, um, you know, how healthy our planet overall is. The ocean is uh, very um, uh, complexly tied to our planet's overall ecological health. And so more sampling and better sampling, uh, more frequent sampling can help improve um, all of these things, including climate research and the planet health in general. So typically sampling is done through a couple of different methods, and there are a couple of companies that output uh, these devices. So there's hand sampling. Um, you can literally, you literally do that with a cup uh, at the surface. Uh, we also have intakes that are onboard uh, ships, research vessels. The Point Sur actually has one of these, and these will be directly hooked up to instrumentation for measuring uh, everything from conductivity, temperature, um, all that stuff. And uh, the the main thing that we're focusing on today is deep water sampling and those are typically accomplished by niskin row sets um we'll get into a little bit about what those are and how my project ties into niskin row sets next so niskin bottles um they're pretty much the standard for deep water um uh, for deep water sampling and they're very simple they they operate on kind of a spring-loaded mechanical advantage and uh, this model you see here was meant to be attached to a line. This line lowered um, to, a, to a depth, and then this weight you see uh, would be dropped. It would um, <coughs> hit the back of the Niskin and close it and cause it to close. Um, our Niskins, uh, the Niskin bottles that we use on the Point Sur and that a lot of other um, oceanographers use are typically arranged in row sets where you'll, ha where you'll have several Niskin bottles all together, and they'll be paired with instrumentation like CTD, um, conductivity and temperature and depth, but uh, also other things like uh, phosphorescence um, instrumentation and, and whatnot. And then, um, so let's see here. So there are a couple of challenges with Niskin bottles. Um, this isn't something that you can go buy and use on your own. It's something that large companies or uh, research organizations have to purchase typically. And uh, you need a large vessel. You need a davit or a crane to lift it. You need the winch for the cable, the cable itself, which is not just you know a piece of steel. It actually has um, electronic um, components on, in, you know, that run through the cable. So it's a, it's a pretty expensive cable. Um, and you also need boat time. Um, one thing about um, Niskin uh, sampling is whenever you're casting the CTD row set down, you have to idle. You have to maintain position, and that's just running your engines constantly in the position, in the same position. Um, in one instance, um, I was on board the Point Sur. We were doing a deep water cast in 1,400 meters of water. It took four hours down and back. It's a long time to be burning diesel. Uh, marine diesel on a large on a large boat and of course when you're doing that you can't do anything else so the engineering problem uh, is this niskin bottles have been used for decades to collect water samples for oceanography however they are typically located on rosettes and cluster and clusters which are paired with instrumentation such as a ctd by limiting a design to one bottle and one pressure sensor a bottle could be made to function automatically the smaller profile would aid with hydrodynamic effects and it could free fall to a target depth. The target depth would need to simply be programmed in. This could be used to shorten cast times and cost. So this is a novel idea. It's new. It's something that I completely came up with on my own. Um, and um, it, it's, it's different from the standard because you could 
do it yourself. You wouldn't need this giant boat. You wouldn't need this tether. You could go out on a dinghy, really, and throw it overboard yourself and recover it. At minimum, what I wanted to accomplish was uh, I wanted to be able to make a device that communicates wirelessly, operates on battery power, descends the water column, and drops its drop weight according to a set time. Um, I have accomplished that, and we'll get into a little bit of, of how I did that. So at first, uh, like any design process, your brain kind of just goes everywhere at first. You really don't know what to tackle. For, I want to say, a good couple of months, that's where I was at, and I was kind of running about everywhere. Um, you know, one week I'd be dealing with electronics, the next week I'd be dealing with numerical analysis. Um, but at first, it's pretty much just drawing and thinking about your ideas. So these are actually snippets from my, uh, my notebook. Um, the one on the left is actually the first drawing I ever made about this project, and it is something I never end up using, but the general form is there, the general function is there. So it has a drop weight, some electronics, and an ISKIN that's integrated. Um, a little bit later, I'm kind of moved uh, to the design you see on the right. And um, the general uh, design process was you know, sharing these ideas with the class, with my professors, and with other people within the USM academic community, and getting feedback on you know, what they felt I should do, or uh, stuff that I might, uh, they, they gave me um, warning about problems I might, I might run into as a, as a result of the choices I made. Um, and I used that feedback to improve my designs or hopefully avoid problems in the future. Um, it's a very kind of give and take, pro and con process that you really have to sit down and, and look at everything. Um, eventually, I came up with this general mission concept, um, kind of ties into the MVP, where you have this device that has a weighted nose cone, and it, its nose cone is the drop weight. So it would go down, it would descend the water column, drop its, its weight, invert its course, and start floating back up to the surface. Whenever it gets to its target depth, it would trigger its Niskin bottle to close. Um, the um, this was all arrived at through brainstorming and we also considered other methods like doing an airbag which we agreed would be a little bit complex to do um, and uh, we, we also were paying attention to standards in, in oceanography and oceanographic instrumentation so drop weights are a very common <coughs> commonly used method for lander recovery for um, for uh, AUV uh, emergency recovery the IVER has an emergency drop weight on it um, so we knew this was something that's been done before, but not in this way. So the first question I kind of really needed to ask myself and answer was how fast do we want this to move? The whole idea is the device needs to be faster than traditional methods. Um, I asked around and uh, our, our CTD uh, casts move at a top speed of 0.8 meters per second. So I knew I kind of wanted to get around that or better. And um, so I needed to ask how fast do I need to do I need to move and how much buoyancy um, and how much weight will get me there to those speeds. To do that, I performed a numerical analysis. For speed, um, we use terminal velocity. Terminal velocity being the speed at which an object will move in a in a medium. Typically, whenever we look at terminal velocity, we're thinking about it in air, right? And um, we don't really consider air to be a very buoyant medium to us, but it actually is. It's just that um, for most purposes and applications for terminal velocity, we for terminal velocity, we ignore buoyancy. Um, however, in the ocean environment, our medium isn't air, it's water, and drag and buoyancy um, have a lot bigger effect on an object. So I needed to uh, really think about what the, the forces that were acting on this body. And if you look here in, um, in the terminal velocity, you'll see the 2 mg. What do we know about an mg? That's its weight, right? It's a mass times gravity. So what is acting directly against that force moving downward? That would be our buoyancy. So what I end, end up doing is kind of combining these terms, and I get this, um, this equation you see at the bottom where uh, terminal velocity is equal to the square root of 2 mg minus our force of buoyancy all over row A, C, D. And I should also state that the A is the cross-sectional area of the device and C, D is the coefficient of drag. I, um, I get, got my coefficient of drag from a NASA website and is actually the coefficient of drag for long cylinders. Um, so this is kind of a rough but educated estimate of how uh, our devices, uh, or what our device's terminal velocity would be. Um, and these are the actual uh, this is the actual data that I produced, and I have those 
marker set on the dimensions I selected as well. And this kind of starts informing my ideas about how big this device needs to be, how, how much foam or how much drop weight material uh, it needs to be. And so I start 3D modeling. And for 3D modeling, of course, I use Fusion 360, Autodesk's Fusion 360. Um, a lot of great things in, in Fusion, and there's a lot of stuff in there that I probably could have used to make this even better, like fluid, uh, you know, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. But for the purposes of this, I mostly used Fusion 360 to build shape files um, and STLs so that I could convert them into 3D print uh, files or G-code. Um, a couple of the functions within Fusion, drawing, extrusion, joining, splitting, holes, projection, these are all things that I used in order to um, you know, keep my design, um, um, keep, keep it made right, I should say. Um, a lot of stuff will get away from you, and if you're not quick, if you're not careful about using Fusion, you will you know, over constrain a dimension. So um, it was definitely a learning process at first, but as I got better at it, stuff just starts flowing out. And of course, all of these cutaway images and, and bisections you see are all produced using Fusion and analysis tools. And then on the top here, you can see the top right hand corner, you can see that um, I have, uh, that's actually the dimensions from the previous analysis in MATLAB that, um, that I've got there. So this would help me uh, just see how the device would look and, uh, and just all goes to the ultimate design of it, specifically the drop weight material and the foam. So next, using the 3D models, um, we get into 3D printing. And 3D printing in itself uh, can be really more of an art than a skill, but it's definitely something that was also a learning curve that took some time to get used to, but now I would say I'm a lot more uh, a lot more warmed up to it. Uh, so all of the 3D printing was done with uh, the Queedy uh, brand iFast printer, dual extruder heads. I also used a couple of dual extrusion functions like printing in you know my normal print material, but then printing other overhangs in a dissolvable support material. So I believe the anchor was actually constructed using that method. Um, we also made sure to select print filaments that were going to you know perform the best for the aquatic environment there's actually only a couple of filaments that are um, that are really appropriate for the aquatic environment and given that this is the marine aquatic environment they really are uh, it really is important to select the right filaments uh, we selected them based on their you know uh, resistance to water which is known as um, uh, hydroscopic uh, Plastics that absorb water readily are known as hydroscopic. So we wanted to have non-hydroscopic filaments. So for us, we chose PETG, um, very common plastic found in water bottles. Um, a lot of time and effort was spent just getting the prints right. And I can't even begin to describe to you the amount of settings that go in and the amount of finite um, control you can have under, over certain functions within uh, 3D printing. It's actually quite, quite marvelous. Um, and then these pictures are just a couple of the um, the settings that uh, Queedy give you. You have infill density and infill pattern or geometry. For all of my prints, they were 100% infill. This was to control buoyancy. If you have um, a non-100% infill print, it's going to have these voids in it, which is great if you're trying to make something quick and you know maybe like an art artistic piece. But for our functional pieces, and especially since they needed to go underwater, they needed to all be 100% infill. So circuit design. Uh, now that we kind of know what the device is going to look like, we need to start figuring out how it's going to function. So originally I chose a solenoid actuator um, to release the drop weight. It would interface with an anchor that was embedded in the drop weight. And whenever that solenoid pin um, moves, it would allow the anchor to separate from the main body. Um, a couple of the requirements of the circuit. So it, it must communicate wirelessly due to the inaccessibility of electronics after waterproofing. All of my electronics were encased in epoxy, which means they, I can't plug a USB um, cable into it to reprogram it or, or access anything. Um, it also must power the microcontroller and a linear solenoid actuator. I have to also be able to turn on the entire device using a magnetic switch that is also related to waterproofing. Uh, and I also need a way to indicate when to uh, actually launch the device. So I used an LED. So a couple going around the, the page here, at the top you have the magnetic read switch. To the right of it, you have the boost converter. So the boost converter is actually what jumps up our voltage on the battery from 3.7 volts to a workable 15 volts for the solenoid. 
And then in the far right there, you have actually our brains, our microcontroller, it's our ESP32. Uh, the ESP32 is great for wireless communication because it has a built-in wireless communication module for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. It can act as a server, it can scan. Um, for my purposes, I use the Bluetooth communication. And then we have an LED right next to that. That was our, our blinking indicator. We have our battery at the bottom, a capacitor, and on the far left, the bottom there, we have a MOSFET. So MOSFETs, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors. These were uh, really great for switching high, uh, switching currents. So the ESP microcontroller doesn't have uh, the ability to, let's say, turn on the solenoid if it's being supplied with 12 volts. It's just too much for the ESP to do. It can't supply 12 volts. So what you have to do is essentially uh, create a switch. The MOSFET acts as a switch with the microcontroller telling it when to turn on and off and the positive and negative ends of the micro of the MOSFET, excuse me, uh, being hooked up to the battery and the solenoid. And we'll get into a little bit of the circuit design here in a second. We'll actually show you a diagram as to how that all fits together because um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So this is actually the circuit diagram. So a lot of circuit diagrams were generated for, for this project. But this is the final one um, for my working demonstrator. So at the top, you will see our positive rails. There's two of them for the two batteries that would be hooked up, and they both share the same ground. Uh, next on the, the left side, I wish I had the pointer on this thing, but you can't really. Let me see here. Wow. Yeah, I found it. All right, cool. That's great. So here's our read switch, which is going to connect directly to the gate on this MOSFET. So this MOSFET is what I call the power uh, pin or the power MOSFET. And both of the uh, boost converter slash solenoid portion of the circuit and the ESP, which are both connected to two separate batteries, they, bo they both connect right here ahead of the MOSFET. So whenever we want to turn on our device, what happens is we, we move a magnet close to this uh, read switch, it closes, which supplies a voltage through here, through this, uh, this resistor and to this gate. Whenever the voltage is high on that gate at its voltage threshold, threshold which is, I believe is 3.5 volts for this MOSFET, uh, for this particular model of MOSFET, uh, whenever it reaches that threshold, it allows current to flow through these batteries to ground which turns on the entire device. Um, as for firing, no, I should actually mention, after the device is turned on, one of, uh, within the programming of the microcontroller, it causes a pin to start supplying its own voltage to this gate through here. That makes sure that I can remove the magnet and the device will stay on by supplying that power gates, uh, power pin voltage, <laughs> I'm sorry, by supplying the gate on the power MOSFETs. <laughs> it'll supply it voltage keeps it on um, and then you are ready to start accepting bluetooth commands uh, we'll get into a little bit of the coding on that in a second but for right now what you need to know is that whenever the solenoid fires a simple signal is sent from the microcontroller to the gate on this mosfet which closes the circuit um, for the linear solenoid to this capacitor and the boost converter the capacitor's purpose is simply to allow um, voltage to change slowly so that not too much current is draw, drawn from the battery um, too quickly. And then next we get into the programming side of things. So I use Visual Studio code to program. Uh, it was really a great piece of technology. Um, especially for programming microcontrollers. It has a large library of microcontrollers, so really it, it, it doesn't require much um, finagling to get your microcontroller to connect. Um, uh, within uh, Visual Studio Code, I used Platform I.O., and I used the Arduino architecture, which is a derivative of C++ and C. Let's see here. So this is the setup. So initially, we start defining some pins. Uh, we have a solenoid pin, an LED pin, and a power pin. The solenoid pin is what triggers the solenoid. The LED pin simply blinks our indicator light. And the power pin is what I was mentioning earlier, turns on, connects the batteries to um, our devices. And in the setup, we do a little bit of housekeeping measures, I like to call it. Uh, we set up our pin modes um, as outputs, and we set our the values of them. So for the power pin, we want to set it to high. That's what I was talking about earlier with us wanting to supply that gate with voltage after um, we you know add the magnet to it um, once that happens we can remove the magnet and then uh, we set the led pin to high that's an indicator light to let us know the entire device is on 
and the solenoid pin to low because we're not ready to fire yet. And next we get into a little bit more of the programming. Let's see, uh, this, is the, this is the loop. So this is where kind of the meat of everything happens. Uh, so we, we first define a couple of, of uh, things. We have this input flag that's meant to keep track of uh, everything in the, in the uh, Bluetooth loop, which we'll get into in a second as well. We also create this uh, int variable called time span, and we create another int variable called delay time. So then we define a while loop. And the condition for this while loop is while serial Bluetooth is available. I, I write it as serial Bluetooth greater than one. So as long as this is true, it will run what's in the while statement. Um, if not, it just keeps cycling through this loop waiting for a Bluetooth uh, connection. So we next create this variable called char holder and another one called int holder. And what this really does is you have to think about how uh, commands are sent in our Bluetooth serial communicate uh, in our Bluetooth serial terminal app, I should say. It sends stuff in char. So we're reading char, but we don't want char, we want int. We want to be able to do math with this, this variable. So say we send it something like 25. At first, uh, char holder becomes the char two. And then what we do right here is we convert it to the int, where we have int holder is equal to um, this conversion of char. And then we subtract 48 from it. That 48 is important. It's the, dis it's the difference um, from, it's the difference from zero, excuse me. It is the difference between zero and char and zero and int is 48. So that is, that is necessary. And then, what we do is we multiply that by uh, by 10 and we add it to time span and then we have this input flag. So we sent it 25, right? And right now we just have two. I should say, my bad. I'm getting a little over myself, y'all. I'm sorry. OK, my bad. So we have this int holder, which is two in int. And we have time span, which we haven't actually set it to anything yet. It's zero. So essentially nothing happens and int holder stays to two. Next, we take in the five and this is kind of where it starts making a little bit more sense because we want 25, right? So our, our Bluetooth serial available iterates and we get another read and we get the five. When that happens, we now have time span, which is now sent to int holder, which was two. And we're multiplying it by 10, so we get 20. We took in that five earlier, we iterate again, it adds to the um, it adds to time span. So now we have 25. So essentially what happens is you take in two, you multiply that times 20, you get, I mean, times 10, you get 20. Then we iterate again and we collect the five. And when that happens, it gets added to 20, 25. And that's how we get 25 from our Bluetooth serial terminal to our ESP. Then our input flag is triggered and we can move on in the loop. We have this indication cycle where we have the LED blink five times as kind of a start signal for when we actually launch the device. And then we have where we, uh, we, we have a waiting period, a delay. So what happens is time scan, span gets multiplied times a thousand and set to delay time. And then we delay for delay time. Um, delay is a function within uh, Arduino that waits uh, depending on how uh, many milliseconds are, are given it. So we get sent it seconds. And last but not least, we actually, f after we delay, we fire the solenoid pin and we wait a little bit and then we turn off the solenoid pin and then we finally turn off the power pin. The device is off and it should be back on the way to the surface using its onboard float. On the right, you have a, um, I should say a, a circuit flow chart. Um, it's kind of resolved horribly, but it shows how the setup and the loop operate um, within my code. So you have the start and then you have an initialization of variables and then you have the setup and then we go into the loop. So this is um, where it goes into the Bluetooth stuff. So like I mentioned earlier, if Bluetooth isn't available, we're just gonna be cycling through this loop right here, essentially waiting for Bluetooth to become available. If Bluetooth is available, we move on. We read some Bluetooth stuff. Um, we set a time span. We, trick, we trip an input flag. And uh, if that is, we check the input flag. If it's yes, we do five uh, one second blinks. We delay for our time span and we drop our weight. 
So that is essentially how the programming side on the ESP works. Conclusions. Um, this device would be cheaper to produce and operate because of the sheer reduction in size and components when compared to its industry standard, the CTD rosette. Also, its untethered nature um, could save cost for idling time as well as you know fuel costs for idling. Um, <coughs> the whole idea behind this is just to save money. Uh, I, I, be I firmly believe if you reduce the cost of scientific research, good scientific research can get done. Stuff like climate protection and climate research. Um, that is the ultimate goal at making scientific research cheaper, more affordable, I should say. Um, in future work, we really would like to do an economic analysis to see um, who would buy this device, if there is a market for it, and whether it would make that difference. Um, I also, I'd, I would love to make a fully functioning prototype um, that would integrate the Niskin model. Um, also, sensors such as you know, the CTD sensors, conductivity, temperature, and depth, as well, you know, pressure sensors, I would love to integrate those. And essentially, we make like an oceanographer within a bottle. You want to look at the thermocline, all you have to do is tell it, sample at the thermocline, and it uses its onboard sensors to go to that depth and sample. Um, and lastly, we definitely need to put a GPS on this thing. It has not been tested out in the ocean yet, but uh, we're already thinking it's going to be difficult to find when it comes back up. So that is something we would need to add to it in order for recovery to go a little bit smoother. And then um, let's see, I think the last thing I have on here is a video actually. If I can get it to run. So at first you see me using a magnet to turn on the read switch, the light comes on, which means the device is powered on, it is ready to receive Bluetooth commands. So then I, I grab my computer with my Bluetooth serial terminal app on it. Bear with us for a second. I had to have some help doing all this. So um, I'm sending it one second. And our device starts blinking and it's ready to go. It plunges, drops its weight, comes back. And we also broke the tail fins off. <laughs> um, so there's definitely improvements to be made structurally to the device. Um, but at the end of the day, were my goals accomplished? I believe so. Um, I was very proud when it happened, and um, you know, I was very, I was very happy to see it come back up. Um, let me see. I'm trying, I'm sorry, y'all. Trying to get some stuff to work for me here. It's not wanting to do anything. Open. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to make it open up. PowerPoint, it's not like, oh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, yeah, okay. And then next. Okay, so before I get to comments and, yeah, yeah, comments and questions. Um, sure. This is also the fact sheet from my, my project. Felt like the fitting thing to put at the end here. Um, How much would it cost to make one for the real like, application? Itself? I'd have to look at, th at um, injection molding costs. I mean, if we're talking real, we're not going to be 3D printing this. Yes. So I would have to look at injection molding costs. Let's say you want to print. Let's say I want to print. I want to say Less than, the cost of, of your prototype. I would say like. 60 bucks maybe less than a hundred dollars really? yeah I'm not even lying to you less than a hundred dollars especially if you could buy an individual like you know sizes and everything I'm th if you're thinking like production level like yeah i mean i didn't even use a whole spool of 3d printer material on that that spool is like 40 bucks <laughs> yeah like like a lot of the cost for making my prototype came from having to buy more material than i needed but of course, that allowed me to have extra tests. You know, I tested five. I did five or six cement pour tests um, with metal. Um, what is the maximum depth that you're aiming for? I have no clue. Um, I originally wanted to go to 300, but um, I think that you know there would need to be a little bit more analysis done on the epoxy, how that works. But I mean, we've seen those deep water lights 
and that epoxy, uh, that company that does the deep water lights and their epoxy field, and they are having them at like thousands of meters. What do you think is the limiting factor in terms of how deep you can go in the to land? My foam. My foam is currently made of polystyrene. Um, it's pretty rigid, but the thing about polystyrene, and if you've ever been on your first research cruise, when you put it down at a depth, it likes to shrink. So buoyancy, like you saw in my equation earlier, is based on volume displacement. So if you shrink your buoyancy component, you are decreasing your volume, which means less buoyancy. Um, so yeah, currently its its main limiting factor is its foam. So if you make your device out of syntactic foam, Ooh. will it still be infinite? <laughs> I don't know. No, we would not. Um, I looked at um, a very similarly sized piece of syntactic foam, non-milled, so just a block that's around that size, and it was about six hundred dollars. Um, 250 more to get it milled to the size I needed. So, you know, it's definitely, definitely, you know, easy to make a prototype when you're thinking about going 30 meters or five meters. But when you start talking about scaling up, kind of how Christian was talking about, there's a lot more you have to look at. And, you know, high engineering materials don't come cheap. Um, if there's one thing I could probably tell anyone, who's in a project where they're using circuitry and stuff. Sorry. Um, one thing I could tell anyone, it'd be that go ahead and fail now. Like, it, it, I'm not saying fail the class. I'm saying go ahead and, you know, as Miss Frizzle used to say, you know, get messy, make mistakes. Um, ask those questions. Don't be afraid to be wrong and don't be afraid to put something together that either might explode or just not work. Because half the time whenever I made realizations was whenever I just was like, I don't know what I'm doing but I'm going to try it and you stuff starts to make more sense. I feel like I pitter pattered a lot around, uh, I pitter pattered around a lot about making the right decision. Um, when I kind of forgot that, you know, you, you're supposed to mess up. You might edit the part of the video before I upload it. Yeah, you can edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> I should have already stopped it. You don't know what you're doing to connect it up. Yeah. We're you going to cruise on 2023. Would you be able to give us something that tested for you? Yeah, 2023? Yeah. yeah, definitely. I think I could. I think that, uh, yeah, I definitely could. I, I, there's a lot I would love to change and do again. Um, Honestly, we really need a good new skin body. Hmm? And most often they do really don't work as we expect mm -hmm. because we're going to go close to a certain depth and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. But if you can give us, I would be able to pay. And uh, as a suggestion, uh, I know that for Kevin, customer. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin gets a lot of the stuff from NRL and. Yeah. The for all these would be good if you can go after a few of their old buoys mm -hmm. and get their foam. Synthetic foam. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. I think the buoys are not synthetic. It depends on the buoy. Yeah. yeah. If it's a mooring buoy, not the surface buoy. No, 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 He's no, no, talking no, about no. like talking deep about water buoy. Yeah. Buoys. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Aren't you planning on patenting this? Planning on applying oh. for the application for a patent. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. We'll see. You know that universities do that. Yeah. Talk We're talk we've talked to Josh. Was that his name? Quavis? Brian. Brian, Brian Quavis. We talked oh, about patenting. Yeah. Yeah, Brian, Brian Quavis. Yeah, we, we talked to him and. Um, I think, yeah, you were there. For selling it to me, you better do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it would be uh, I would love to start again and really integrate the Niskin bottle and get everything working. Well, seriously, it's a very good idea. You should add it. Well, thank you. Couldn't have done it without you guys. And Kamal, wherever he may be. <laughs>